you want to improve your life and you love sports? Well, tonight we're talking to Tim and Jody to find out what we can learn from the world of sports to make our lives even better. Thanks for listening. Hi, good evening, everyone. And we are in studio tonight talking about what we can learn from our sports heroes. Because think about it, we hear so much about um, like sports heroes who have broken records, or our favorite team that wins the World Cup event, and we get so excited. And there's something about when a person can perform at that peak level and achieve it. It's just, it makes one, I think it's humanly possible. But, but what goes into someone achieving like that. So it just amazes us. And so with me in the studio tonight, I have Tim Goodenough, a meta coach who specializes in working with elite athletes and sports teams and who wrote the book called In the Zone with South Africa's Sports Heroes with his co-author, Michael Cooper. Love you to have you here. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much. Cool. And we also have Jody Martins. He's also a meta coach and now actually calls himself a dream coach mm -hmm. who also has been coaching cricket for over a decade. Yeah. I've um, also got my producer, Tim Hark, and I'm Talana Simpson. And yeah, I just love talking about what's possible. And today we're talking about what can we learn from the world of sports. So Tim, in, in your book, I've got a copy here, nice big green yeah, cover. And you actually spent, I don't know, it was a couple of years interviewing 17 of our top sports heroes and really analyzed their mental skills and looking for what supported them to achieve their you know, such high levels of performance. Who were some of the athletes that you spent time with? Um, so off the top of my head, I think well, Penny Haynes comes to mind in terms of winning double gold. I think since we, we started the Olympics again in 92, we've won four golds as a country, which is not a tremendous amount considering the amount of talent we've got and the amount of amazing people we've got here. And half of those are pennies. Uh, so, yes, so in so terms of her story, you know, she's just an amazing and also nice sports in terms of what he did. Cheryl Calder with hockey and also her, the beginnings of the genesis of her visual art skills, her art gym. She's done amazing work and is the only person ever to win back-to-back -back World Cups. Uh, Max Mapagnani, SA Player of the Year, footballer par excellence. Lucas Redebe changed the way uh, South Africans look at uh, the English Premier League and making it there. Um, Graham Smith. You know, youngest SA captain, uh, Sean Pollock, you know, a legend in, in the game. It's just, a, it was amazing to to meet all these people and, and try to understand. The question we asked ourselves is that, is there something going on that all these people are doing consistently? Because if we knew they had something consistent, then we would know where to start. Mm. So instead so, of, yeah. Was there? Well, that, that was, fortunately was. <laughs> fortunately, there was enough to create a book. And what we found, in fact, there were 13 things they all had in common, male and female, uh, nine different sporting codes, three different generations, where they're all doing the same things as a foundational level. So now all of a sudden we can start to define what is mental toughness, because it's normally a fluffy kind of thing. People learn about it because you win, you must have it, you lose, you don't. Uh, you win a World Cup or you choke a World Cup is normally how people refer to an event to uncover if someone has it. Now all of a sudden we uncovered what were the, the makeup, what were the skills, what were the components, what were the ingredients of this thing. And, and fortunately for us, we used a tool called benchmarking to actually measure it. So we've got mm. a tool to measure mental toughness, which is pretty exciting for us. So, so what do you actually mean by, by mental toughness? Because this is what I want to be, I'm understanding what's, what was common amongst all, all of those, those athletes. And it's what made them great versus just good. Is it? So, so, so it's it's the, the couple of synonyms get thrown around. So sometimes people talk about being in the zone. The zone's normally an event. It's a moment in time when time goes away and you just it's just a peak experience. Things. Yeah, uh, just it's that book that you that look moment. up and it's night time. It's the movie and it's over. It's a conversation in the kitchen. And it's all of a sudden two in the morning. <laughs> uh, it's that moment in time when it was just it was so effortless. So you can just you can just dance. You can just play. You can just be. And so what we find is that holding that moment in time and place was a whole complex mindset that we tried to unpack. And so sometimes a synonym to describe that mindset is being mentally tough. So I lecture for the Investec International Rugby Academy and the, our definition of mental toughness is this, it's the ability to be at your maximum every time. So the ability to perform at be your at maximum. Your maximum every time. Every time, not just when you, you, you know, your coffee isn't right or mom didn't phone you to say that she loved you or your girlfriend's <laughs> not fighting with you or the field's wrong or there's a bus puncture or there's politics or there's this every time. So how do you do that? So, so the question is, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and in the short answer, it's about understanding what the components of mental toughness are, and that's what hopefully we unpacked in the book in terms of the foundational stuff. There's still some unique parts that individuals will, will have according to their personality or their sport or their history. But the foundation, what we found over the last few years, having tested it and refined and tested and refined, is that we, we're just refining the language, not the model. Uh, we've got better ways to describe things now as opposed to changing things. So it does fit and it has consistently worked. So the two parts of mental toughness are know what you're going for okay. and know where you're at. And obviously that replies, so how are you going to get from where you're at to where you're mm -hmm. going to, which is the, 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 the partnership. That's the coach. That's the mentor. That's the mental coach like Jody and I are. That's the people out there that can support you doing that because at the moment not many people know how. You know, in sport, it's lucky underpants most of the time. And if you don't have lucky <laughs> underpants or they're not working or like they get lots of holes in like my lucky underpants have, Sorry about that, Mom. <laughs> is that, uh, you know, then what? What do you do if your favorite song isn't working for you anymore, if your Special K brand doesn't do the trick? And the answer is you've got to find out what is working for you and what does work for you so far and also what might fit for you going forward. So, yeah, that sounds quite personal to, to the individual. But from your book, you, you've out, you know, you found that there are common things so, so maybe the, the content is individualized but the structure is <laughs> as, as we know very much in, in the work we do so I know one of the, f the first thing we were talking about earlier is the performing from one's highest intention yeah. so, so the big why so I'm guessing all the, the top athletes had a, a major reason or a, how, well, how did they word it, it, it it's, it's, it's two things it's one is having that big reason where when they talk about you kind of the, the world stops a little bit like you you get a bit of goosebump moments. You you see a look in the eye where you're like, "Well, this is not a conversation. This is a this is a statement of intention. This is a this is purpose coming from someone's mouth. This is this is real. This is powerful. This is magical." So when they spoke about the reasons why, so I give you an example. Penny Haynes, she believes that in terms of her faith, she's a very religious woman. Her faith is about sharing her faith with other people, and her mechanism of doing that is sport, and her sport mechanism is swimming. So for her, like she's a swimmer, breaststroker who would train for hours a day, five, six hours, hundreds of laps. Mm. And for her, her big intention was she wanted to proclaim her faith. But the secret was not just once every four years at the Olympics, but every single day. And so she was so full of intention. She said every lap, which is in the pool, as she takes a stroke, it's an act of worship. Sure. So imagine for six hours a day for every, there's 23 strokes there, 17 back was, what, was 17 there and 23 back if I remember correctly. Every stroke is a for spiritual awakening, it's a spiritual heart, it's a spiritual jolt. Of course you're going to be doing it for five or six hours. I mean, why wouldn't you? And she knew that reason and was able to perform it. So that's the distinction, knowing why and doing it on a daily basis. You need both. So it's, it's effectively, in a way, putting purpose in, into all your, your mechanisms of getting where you want mm -hmm. so that you're actually not getting rewarded at the end but getting rewarded every single, every day. single day. Every single day. Cool. And they're very unique to the individual. It tends to not be the generalized sort of I want to be the best I can be sort of sort of thing it's what they've discovered and often accidentally and, and this is the thing that uh, frustrates me specifically is that we've got the mechanism to find that on purpose so even right now if you're not very intentional about what you're doing you can become more intentional you can start mm. to find what reasons you do have and when you start to scratch that itch about why you're doing what you're doing it starts a whole magical process of really yes. becoming understanding of what really drives you or moving towards finding out what drives you. So it really is a special thing to see. But unfortunately, the technology to do that, while it's quite simple, it's not well known. So neurosemantics, in terms of what we study, is a lot about that. How do we do what we know? How do we put the why, the why in terms of what we're doing? And so in terms of what we try to do here is to share that. So people can say, if you want to find out your intention for your job, for your relationship, for your wealth, for your family, if you could find that big why, how much different will things be for you in your conversations and your performances? You know, for businesses, for example, entrepreneurs, you know, I, I don't know many entrepreneurs who love doing their tax, <laughs> except for the guys involved with tax, of course, that's yeah. a whole different story. But I mean, that's a part of business. So if you had your why of, I'm going to build this multinational, whatever global thing you're trying to do, and part of that's doing my tax, so then it's a bit different, isn't it? But if it's just tax and I hate that stuff. You tend to well, put it off. And it's, mm. it's adding purpose into getting through the hard bits and all the rest of it. And that brings you into what I mentioned also makes things a lot more fun. And, you know, everything you're doing, you, you feel like you're taking a step further. Um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, so you, you, I'm just asking because you're the expert here. So it's, it's, <laughs> well, it's, 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 uh, there's two things here that happens. is When you're intentional about what you're doing, your performance improves. 
Okay. Because you're bringing all of you to the party. Not part of you is wondering about, oh, did I say this? Or what did I say in that meeting? Or did I leave the stove at home on? Uh, you're there, you're completely you're present. And the second thing, when you're present, of course, your performance improves. Yeah. Because you're training at a high level, you're learning at a high level, you're being present at a high level, you're communicating at a high level, you speaking in your talk show at a high level, you're doing whatever you can a little bit more. Mm. And what happens then, of course, you grow more. So, so the numbers in high performance are very small. So for example, if someone who wanted to be better, if you just improve 1% every week, in a year's time, it'll be two thirds better. But who, who sets out to be 1% better this week? Who sets out to be 5% better at changing gears? Who sets out to be 10% better at saying kind words to their spouse? Who's, who does that? And the answer is the people who are the best do that. Because they are intentional, they have this um, big reason, and hence it drives them to be more, more focused. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that they worked and, at a higher level for longer. So, so for me, that's the talent equation is that people who have more accurate training for longer. And so some people start ahead in the race. So they might, if, I used to think about a 100 meter race when I was a child and I was six or seven and, you know, gee, it was a long way. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I took off and the guys were really fast. We were already five strides ahead of me and I'm like, what's going on here? And I think that's how talent is, is that some people are ahead of the race and that momentum carries them to a certain point. But if they don't work beyond that, that's how they race their race. And for the guys like me who have had to learn the skills, who had to really plot and grind it out, I'm catching them. And some of them I've already caught and the other guys I believe I will catch because the technology is in the stride. It's how much progress are you making every time you train or practice or perform or work or do what you, whatever you're doing. And if you can stride faster, by default, you'll catch the person no matter how far ahead they started in the beginning. And so what happens, the danger with talent is that people think you've got it or you don't. Oh, I'll never be a great speaker, I'll never be a great salesman, I'll never be a mathematician, because someone told them that maybe and they believe it. Okay, yeah. yes, Mrs. Fitzsimmons, I'm not good at maths, I'll believe you for the rest <laughs> of my life. Uh, there's a lot of this tie into so the thousand hours of, of work and I, I know so I was reading something where they say like a lot of the top sportsmen are all born in like January, February and that's because when they were younger they were a bit bigger than the other boys because they had a year of growth mm -hmm. so they, they got that little bit more, as you said, a yes. little bit of a head start which then throughout the rest of their life just grew and grew with the other guys if they managed to also get that, you know, a lot of them would actually be further yeah. than they are if they chose to put, put that effort in. So, so that was Roger Barnsley's research, he's a Canadian sports psychologist as reported in Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers and a few other books. Yeah. And, and what, he, what he spoke about was that those kids were bigger, more coordinated, and especially in ice hockey, which is the study he spoke mm, about, mm. is that only the coordinated kids get the time on the rink, because there's not so many rinks around. Mm. So if you're not that kid, you don't get in the A side, you miss out on two hours of high quality practice over time, you fall behind in the race. But the party didn't mention, and I wish he had, um, is that you also start to believe it. You start to believe you're the A, a player, you start to believe you're in the A class, the first team player. And that belief becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And worse than that, the kids who didn't make it, they start to believe that too. They're I'll never not, be yeah. in the first mm. team. I'll never be good at maths. I'll never be good at that. Unless they've got really strong parents or a really a strong foundational home to challenge that belief, then that might stick too. What was this thing? The other thing they said, they other, uh, th think they did a similar study with baseball players. And it was that being in January, February, or if your parents were baseball players, so yeah. that they put a lot of effort into you and you could also get then quite often get through. So, so in Super Freakonomics, they said that if your dad was a baseball player, you're 800% more likely to be a major league baseball player yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and so some people talk about genetics, and there is a part of that, I believe, but also it's, it's the role modeling. So you learn about the world from mom or dad's example largely, and then family, friends, peers, etc. But if Teachers. mom or dad believe they can make it, and they show that they make it because they work hard, well, then I've got the recipe to do the same. So as a child growing up, seeing dad as a major league baseballer who would have worked hard to get there, I can see the recipe for what I need to do. And plus, maybe I've got some genetics, maybe not. But my belief is that the role modeling is so much more important and significant of here's an example of, and if dad can do it, I can do it yeah, too. It's that belief of me too. I can get that. So Jody's nodding his head there. <laughs> yeah, no, I just think parents are, are crucial in, in, in the way sports kids develop. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier before the show started, it's the kids that I work with where the parents are not pushing the kids, they're not telling the kids what to do and how to do things, um, but they support them. They provide them with what they need 
and they and they're giving them these constant messages of you can, it is possible. Just uh, gotta work at it. W- keep working at it, and if it means the dad goes down to the cricket nets with a kid and throws balls, and he can't sleep on his arm anymore, <laughs> but he's throwing his kids the balls, then then that's what it takes, and it it helps to get the kids. It's that support system. I should it bring gets in the kids to the top sort of thing, yeah. Sorry, JD. No, it's yeah. fine. Are you talking about earlier also that you that you've got to be careful about how you support it, about the wording the and all feedback, the rest of yeah. it? Yes. Mm. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that briefly so, now. so the types of feedback their parents give their kids specifically creates an effect. And so if you're giving feedback on things that are largely out of your kid's control, i.e. you are talented or you are smart, then Beautiful. it doesn't give them much behavior. What I do now to reinforce mom and dad's good stuff, I mean, they're happy when they said that to me. That felt good. I liked it. They liked it. But now what do I do? So in terms of beautiful, maybe you get thin. Maybe you wear makeup. Maybe you, you try to become something that you saw on TV or in a magazine. And in terms of eating disorders, there's some, you know, huge, there could yeah. be a, a link there, I would suggest there is. <laughs> uh, but in terms of talent itself, is that if you gave the feedback, wow, you must have worked really hard. Gee, you must have really persevered with this. Wow, you, I can see how much dedication you put in. That gives direct feedback in terms of what they can do and, and how, what the route to, to the next stage is or the next step is. and also means it's in their control. So the reason why they didn't perform well in this game was not because they were less talented or too small or some of the other reasons I often hear. It's just perhaps they hadn't worked hard enough yet. Mm. And if they really loved it and they really wanted it, how can we be part of that? How can we support you working hard in what you love? And so here's the other distinction. It's not mom or dad's love uh, for cricket or rugby mm. or, or, or soccer, whatever it is. It's the child's love. Yeah. That's that's held in, in respect by mom and dad. You know, sure they might love the sport, but they're not trying to live their dreams through their child. They're not trying to live vicariously to be able to 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 achieve what they didn't mm. uh, or, or couldn't as as mm. an athlete through their children. It's their children's drive, it's their children's ambition, it's their children's hopes and dreams that they're just holding a space to really enjoy that experience. So, you know, and if they spend time developing their sports ability, they would be with a good role model to showing their well, children how to. Or any ability. To develop any ability, yeah. So it doesn't have to be sports. If they role model struggling, if they role model grinding it out, whether it's learning a dance class, doing pottery, singing, uh, singing doing whatever they want to do to, to, Language. to express themselves, mm. to want more. That So what happens in terms of children is that often parents don't role model that, is that if you think about the, the great athletes, Tiger Woods' his dad, Earl Woods only started playing golf uh, a year before Tiger was born. So he had this passion for golf. He was a great athlete. Uh, Earl Woods is really good at baseball, but he felt he couldn't get anywhere in American baseball because he wasn't white. So he went to the one place where he wouldn't be discriminated was, and in his mind was the military, where he could be judged on his merit, but still a great amount of athletic ability. And so he, when he found golf, as this is the thing for me. And he used to, from, almost as a grudge, as a babysitter, you're like, okay, Tiger, you sit in the chair. I want to be hitting my golf balls. And what happened? He hit golf balls for hours at a time. Oh, hang on, I'm babysitting too. And what you look over and Tiger was following the ball and he was tracking it. And he was like, wow, dad's loving this and I'm loving watching dad loving this. So Tiger learned about his love of improving golf as well as his love of golf from his dad. Mm. And so most parents that I see with kids who are struggling, they're learning about the love of the sport, but never the love of improving in the sport from their parents. And that's a critical thing they're mm. missing. And it can be the same too, I suppose, um, marks in subjects, mm. the love of learning instead of, oh, hmm. The other point I really liked in your book was around um, how to handle pressure because athletes definitely have a lot of pressure. It's like a key, you know, a key element in their ability to perform is how they work under that moment when the whole world is watching them <laughs> kick that last ball. Um, so you talk about being able to effectively manage both anxiety and confidence. I would have thought that you actually want to eliminate the anxiety, you know, totally and just rather be confident that you're going to get that ball. What, what are your thoughts? So, so for me, the, the, the confidence is that if you ask people what informs their confidence, so how do you know to be confident, how do you know not to be confident, is most people would give you kind of a vague answer, oh, I just felt that way. It's just how I woke up today. And at best, they might be like, oh, these things happened. And so the question I ask, so what's your recipe for confidence? And what do you need to have happen to allow you to feel confident, to make that judgment of confidence? And the follow-on, how much of that is in your control? Because sometimes confidence is the way that the coach spoke to me. Confidence is how dad spoke to me on the way to the, to the game or, or how the fans are talking about me or what's been said in the press at a higher level. Mm. And so that obviously is a recipe for disaster if you're outsourcing something to someone who actually doesn't know their job of filling you with confidence. I mean, they can't do it 24-7 and therefore you're going to miss something. So the top guys, Gary Kirsten did this best. He said that he believes confidence is based on your work ethic. It's like 
studying for exam where you've studied the entire book, all you can do is your best now because you, you've created no shortcuts. But that creates the honesty of have I done everything I can within my power to be ready for this? Have I prepared well? Have I thought about it? Have I looked at all the angles? Have I done everything in my power and beyond, not just what people have given me in terms of preparation, but have I researched this? Have I figured out, like I say, that if you're going to be someone who achieves your dream, you're going to be the exception. So what is your plan to be exceptional? So if you don't know that, if you don't know what you're doing, you can't be truthful to yourself. I'm really confident about this because there's a part of you that says, hang on, I took some shortcuts. I didn't stretch long enough. I didn't do what was required to, to do that. So, uh, Jody, I'm sure you find with the kids that you work with that the guys who walk out there confident, part of that recipe is often is how hard they prepared and how yeah. much work they've done. Yeah, definitely. I find that the kids who, who, who uh, have confidence issues, if I can call it that, um, are the ones who don't work hard are the ones who kind of expect it to just come to them, are the ones who um, rely, as Tim said, on, on an outside source to provide them with that, like the pat on the back or the lucky underpants or the <laughs> <laughs> something like that to give them that confidence. But, but the ones who are truly confident, and, and you can see it in their body language, sort of, when they walk out, you can see they're upright, they, they, they're walking in a way when the ball is bowled at them, they, their feet start moving, things happen in the way we want them to happen. So. It's the perception of there's a confident person there. I also know those are the kids that do work the hardest. But I also think it's about the type of practice that they do in the sense that they are preparing for what they're going to face. Their practice is not um, easier most of the time than it is out there. They practice at a higher level and a higher intensity than what they get in the game. So it creates that sense of, you know what, I've been through this before, I've done this before, whatever comes my way now I can handle. So it's almost like studying the whole book and doing, doing that bit extra. Um, yeah, so I, I agree, I agree with that. I just want to ask one question with that. How much of it is it though, the ones that are confident and believe they will succeed, you know, they know that it's worth putting the effort in. So they do put the effort in. You know, I mean, it's one of those... Uh, when, the, when you have confidence, you're going to go, well, I, I know I can do this and yeah. I can do better. So I'm, I, it's, the effort I'm putting in now is worth it because it's going to pay off. Where the ones that aren't confident yeah. go, well, you know, it's, it's maybe not worth my time. They sort of self-fulfill themselves yeah. out of it. So, so the thing is, do they have a big enough why? Do they have the reason for why they're doing what they're doing? It comes back to that yeah, again. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. And, and the second thing about that is, is what's the quality of their training? So if I don't know I'm improving by 5% every training, then I also wouldn't feel confident that I'm going to catch someone who's much better than me right now. If I didn't know the reason he might be better is because he's eight months older than me and he's, you know, he's seven and I'm seven and just because I haven't had my growth spurt, that's the difference rather than, oh, I can't do this. So it's a combination of the belief system the child balls up. I believe I can't because of why? Mm. Because of mom and dad said, because of what coach said, because of what I think, or actually, hang on, I understand what's going on here. I'm just younger. And, and I haven't trained hard enough, or more importantly, I haven't trained smart enough to catch him. So if I want to catch him, I've got to train better than he trains. Am I doing that right now? Probably not. Well, that's quite a good reason not to feel confident because I've got no reason. There's no solid reason to be con So confidence at its heart is based on competence. And competence is a result of work ethic. And if you don't have competence, that's fool's confidence. That's when you think you're going to be great, but you've, I'm sure I could play violin. I mean, looks quite, mm -hmm. Vanessa May, I mean, she just hardly yeah. even looking at her thing when she's doing that. <laughs> I'm sure I could, but that obviously would end up in a bit of a disaster once yeah. you find out how little competence you have. Yeah. So that informed knowledge of how good you actually are requires you to see yourself clearly, but also not limit what you think is possible for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because people will tell you, I don't think you can make it. I don't think you've got the talent. I don't think you've got the ability. And I always want to ask those people who say that is that, so show me your trophy cabinet. So you must have made it all the way to tell me that you haven't. So where's your World Cup medals? How many World Championships have you won? Oh wait, no you haven't. So how do you know? Now I've been doing this game for 20 or 30 years and, and sure there is some indicators that people might not make it, but the sure way not to make it is to tell someone that. Or for them to believe that they can't mm. because then Because someone they won't. told me, he must yeah. be true, he's been doing this for 30 years, mm. he must mm. be true. He's the expert. Mm. He's the expert. So that's a real danger is that like for me when I hear, like I see a young kid who's now 14 or 15 one of the camps and he says, I want to be a Springbok. And I'm watching him play and, and the reason he's playing for the C team is there's no D team. You know, he really is not a great athlete. And so for my response is, geez, you must have a great plan. Because right now you're in the C team and you want to go all the way to Springbok. How many years? 10 years? 15 years? What are you looking at? So what is your plan and what are you doing about it on a daily basis to get there? Because, gee, you must have a great plan to believe that. Uh, uh, okay, so what would your plan be if you wanted to go for this? How can you see things differently? What could be possible? How do you know how much you improve? What have you researched? How do you know? What do you know about recovery? What do you know about strength? What do you know about 
and then start that process of co-creating with them just by holding them accountable to what they believe tentatively. They're putting it out there for an adult to validate or to crash. And for me, I'd rather validate with some sort of concrete support of, okay, so what are you doing about this? So mm -hmm. I don't know what's possible. Some of the most amazing things, Steve Jobs did impossible things for True. so yeah. many years. So what, it, what would the world be like if he believed someone who said they were, he was nuts? <laughs> that you couldn't put a dent in the universe, that you couldn't be there. I mean, what a, it frightens me that, that, that we're so quick to judge dreams or possibilities because we're going to talk possibilities about understanding we actually don't know. But if someone's got half a hope of that, let's support them finding out how to make the best possible chance. And there's an old adage that if you go for the moon, you, you just might get the stars. Mm. But one of the greatest dangers of setting low quality goals or small goals is you just might get them too. Yeah. So who's to say, I, you know, I really, I think there's so much more that we can do and it improves and increases every single day. Mm. So that for me is a very exciting time to apply your mind to whatever. So not having talent is no longer a requirement to get high performance. And even that is an idea, mm. wow, mm. it means I can go for what I love. So what I love. Mm. Also, and rather, rather be plan? doing what you love and, you know, enjoy it every day than be doing something you hate. And Yeah. So happier, more performance, bigger strides, even if you're way behind in the race. Even if you're terrible, you'll get somewhere. And won't you enjoy that journey? Mm -hmm. And who's to say how far that journey goes? I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Cool. Sounds I don't know, was awesome. there anything else you wanted to? Um, no, maybe just, just to, to end off, because we're coming to the end, is I always love asking you guys, what do you believe is possible? <laughs> Well, so, I mean, you've touched on a bit. Touched on a bit. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I get really excited whenever I meet any athlete who walks in my office and he says, I want to be a Springbok, I want to be a pro tier. Sometimes I want to be an All Black, which is quite interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, that's fine if that's what you want. Um, you know, for me, okay, so what have you done? What, what's your plan? And, and I really think knowing what we know now about talent and talent development, that it, there's very little things that can't be achieved if you work hard and smart enough for an extended period of time. You have that plan and that big why and the right kind of feedback. Yeah, so, so the, the, the next book that I'm just finishing up now is called Raising Talents. The four key components of developing talent is one is your big dream. Mm -hmm. Two, you work smart and hard. A lot of people work hard, not many people work smart, smart. and hard. <laughs> you could do a 10 hour day or a 15 hour day, it doesn't mean you've got 15 hours worth of quality. So mm -hmm. what's the quality of what you're doing? Thirdly, how fast do you learn? If learning is largely related to experience, you must be a great learner. So do you study or learn or review every practice that you do. At what level, at what detail do you learn from others? How quickly do you do that? How quickly do you implement it? Et cetera, et cetera. So to be world-class, you better be a world-class learner. And the fourth part, give yourself respect. If you want world-class results, you've got to treat yourself in a world-class way. You've got to look after yourself because mm. if you don't, who's to say someone else is going to be kind enough or have the time to do that for you. So for me, with those four components, I don't know what's possible. I think much more that anyone has given credit to so far, and we're creating a generation that can take that, and me as an adult, I'm taking that now, I'm learning how to sing, I did some dancing earlier in the year, <laughs> I don't know what's next, piano is next actually, piano is for next year, but why not, if I love to do it, even if I'm rubbish, here's a process, why not take it, let's find out. And you don't know what other skills you might learn through that. Yeah, and what? How cool is that? Very cool. What, did you <laughs> take? what do you believe is possible, JD? Um, very shortly, I believe anything is possible. Um, but from specifically from a sports point of view, um, I think the the one thing that that I don't like, if I can call it that, is that when a parent comes to me and he says, uh, "So, Jody, do you think my kid's got potential?" Um, and it's almost like, in my mind, at times the parents want to kind of say, "Okay, well, he's, hey, he hasn't got this potential, so we're not going to waste any time with it." So my my general answer normally to them is. I'm not the person that can say that. It's up to that individual how far he wants to go and what it is that he wants to achieve with it. So I believe from a sport point of view that we can have so many people knocking on South African team doors. Um, it's scary, but not everybody believes it basically because of some of the things we've spoken about tonight. Um, why don't we want to be in a position? Well, we might be from a cricketing point of view because half the England team is South African, but... <laughs> We, we can be in a position where we can field three world-class teams and beat any opposition. But not everybody believes that that's possible. So yeah. it comes down so much to belief, the mm -hmm. mindset we have and, and the belief we've got. Yeah. So I think what I'm really taking away from all this sports talk is, is having a big why. So taking that back into my mm -hmm. world, my work in that, just getting my, my why really 
clear for myself mm -hmm. and then working, having developing the plan and what I'm going to do from where I am now to where I want to get to and how am I going to measure, how am I going to benchmark my way, mm -hmm. way there, which is awesome. So just to wrap up, how can people get hold of you, Tim? So, Tim, good enough. There's not too many of us around. There's me and a soya bean farmer. So if you get that <laughs> wrong, perhaps you're not the person I need to speak to. Um, but no, just Google me. You can find me. I've got a website, coachingunity.co.za, where me and my business partner, Mark Cooper, we do a lot of work with talented people, both in the corporate world and the sports world, also from a team point of view. And, uh, and you can find me on Twitter again and also on Facebook. Wherever it is, it would be great um, to hear from you. And Twitter's Tim Good Enough ZA. ZA, yes. Yeah. And Jody. Um, I'm on the Inner Coaching website. It's innercoaching.co.za. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm on Facebook, I think. <laughs> cool. So. I, I'm on Twitter, but I don't really use it much. <laughs> <laughs> but go, yeah, if you go to innercoaching.co.za, yeah. I think yeah. you'll get in. Also, obviously, in the show notes below this is, is all the details of our guests. And I'd love to continue to talk about possibilities around learning from sports. So if you want to tweet me, I'm on LT Possibility, or you can find us on Facebook and our blog, ltp.letstalknetwork.tv. And my next show will be on Monday, the 28th of November, and tomorrow it's the Let's Talk Sports, sports. team. They're going to be talking more sports, so <laughs> you can join them then. But otherwise, yeah, mm. anything's possible, guys. Just got to believe it. We'll see you later. Mm-hmm. Cool. cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.